Hello and welcome to this Biology 6 lecture on the uh, nervous system, or I should say part one uh, of the lecture on the nervous system, because this nervous system lecture will be divided into three parts, and this is part one. Okay, well, it's sort of a momentous occasion today because the nervous system is actually the first organ system of the body that we're going to be studying. Up till this point in the semester, we've been working our way up this hierarchy of biological structures. You know, we learned that atoms are the building blocks of molecules, and molecules are the building blocks of cell organelles, and cell organelles are the building blocks of tissues, and tissues are the building blocks of organs, and uh, organs are the building blocks of organ systems, uh, and of course the body is built out of the 12 organ systems of the body. Yeah, but up to this point, we've been working uh, through this level, but it's time to start uh, talking about the organ systems of the body. Yes, and the first organ system we are going to be talking about is the nervous organ system, or just nervous system for short. Okay, so here's kind of a, a picture of the nervous system, all these organs you see inside her that are uh, yellow colored, any shade of yellow, are organs of the nervous system. So let's begin with a uh, definition of the nervous system. If you look inside the lecture handout, it says for the nervous system is defined as the organs that are made out of nervous tissue. And let's just kind of stop there. Well, what's an example of an organ in the body that's made out of nervous tissue? And probably the best example is the brain. It's made out of nervous tissue. Okay, now, um, it, and there, there are several other organs uh, that are part of the nervous system. I was just using the brain as an example. Now, uh, the nervous system is traditionally traditionally divided into two regions called the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So let's start off with the central nervous system. The central nervous system, or CNS for short, is the region of the nervous system that consists of the brain and the spinal cord. And you can see why they call it the central nervous system because it runs more or less down the central axis of the body. The other region of the nervous system is called the peripheral nervous system, or PNS for short, and it's basically defined as all the nervous tissue that's outside of the CNS. So all the nervous tissue that's outside of your brain and spinal cord is your peripheral nervous system. And so what, what are these organs of the peripheral nervous system? Well, they're mostly nerves. Um, nerves are sort of structures that branch out of the CNS, structures that branch out of the brain and the spinal cord. That's what they're showing you here. Um, anyway, yeah, so nerves are the major organs of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so just to summarize, the nervous system is all the organs in your body that are made primarily of nervous tissue, and the nervous tissue, uh, the nervous system is subdivided into the CNS and the PNS. The CNS is the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and the PNS is all the nervous tissue organs outside of the CNS, uh, which are mostly the nerves that you see here, here branching out of the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, so those are the regions of the nervous system, but what are the functions of the nervous system? Well, that's also um, covered in your lecture handout as part of the definition of the nervous system. Uh, the nervous system carries out uh, the following functions, and then in the lecture handout it lists the three functions of the nervous system, sensing stimuli, formulating responses to the stimuli, and transmitting signals rapidly between body parts. So let's go through those, those three functions of the uh, nervous system. And the first one on the list, sensing stimuli, let me use an example of touch stimuli for that. So imagine the cursor is, is a fly that's bugging this poor woman. And let's say the fly, for some reason, chooses to land right here on her forearm. And the fly starts walking around. Well, you know, that's a touch stimulus. It's a, the fly is walking on her skin. Walking on her skin counts as touch. Well, there is nervous tissue in her all the skin all throughout her body uh, there's nervous tissue in the skin for detecting touches and so um, here we go uh, yeah so the nervous tissue in her skin would be the tissue that detects that sense stimulus the touch now I guess I should say well what are sense stimuli uh, sense stimuli are things like touches and tastes and smells uh, and, and, and sounds um, um, uh, things that that we can sense are, are the sense stimuli. Anyway, so touch is a sense stimuli, and what I'm saying is one of the jobs of nervous tissue is to detect those those uh, sense stimuli. 
um, and, and you know, I'm using the skin as an example of an organ in your body that has um, nervous tissue inside of it for detecting sense stimuli. But we obviously have other sense organs. Your eyes contain nervous tissue for detecting light, and your nose contains nervous tissue for detecting smells, just as, as examples. So yeah, any sense organ in your body uh, will always have nervous tissue in it for detecting sense stimuli. Okay, so yeah, in our example, um, the nervous tissue in her skin detected the uh, sense stimulus of a touch from the fly walking on her skin. Now, that sense signal, uh, and, and we call that the we call the the signal that um, uh, gets generated by um, by your uh, nervous tissue detecting a sense stimulus. We call that a sense signal. Um, that sense signal has to be sent to her brain. Why? Well, your brain is where your consciousness resides. And so for her to be consciously aware that something has touched her skin, the signal has to be sent to the brain. And so when I click the button here, we'll see the sense signal, the sense nervous signal, traveling up through the nervous tissue to get to her brain. And that brings us to um, the you know, another one on the list of functions of the nervous system. It's the, uh, it's the nervous system that transmits signals rapidly between body parts. So think of the nervous um, system also as being like the body's rapid telegraph system to carry signals rapidly from one body part to another, like from her arm here uh, up to her brain. And so here we see that. Okay, yeah, so... Uh, Summarizing so far, the functions of the nervous system is sensing stimuli, but also transmitting signals rapidly between body parts. For instance, uh, transmitting sense signals from a sense organ uh, up into the central nervous system so they can arrive at the brain. Oh, no, incidentally, when I was showing that nerve signal, the, the sense nerve signal, I showed it looking a little bit like an electrical spark, right? Well, I did that on purpose because, as we'll talk about later on in this lecture, um, nervous system signals are electrical signals. I know that sounds kind of weird and fascinating, but your body uses electricity just like computers use electricity. Um, uh, your, the nervous system uses electricity. The, the, the nervous system signals are electrical signals. Okay, um, well, so the signal, that sense signal has been uh, transmitted by your nervous system rapidly uh, from where the signal started in her arm up into her brain. And now, once the uh, the nervous system signal has arrived in her in in the brain part of her central nervous system, now um, we're going to get the next function of the nervous system, which is formulating a response to the stimulus. And so, you know, she's now going to become consciously aware that something touched her arm when that nerve signal reaches the, reached the brain. And so now, different regions of the brain are going to talk to each other, saying, "Ooh, something touched our arm. It felt like a bug. I don't like bugs." You know, and so that's what was listed in the lecture handout as uh, formulating a response to the stimulus. Uh, so that's also one of the functions of your nervous system. Um, it happens inside the central nervous system, mostly inside the brain, but it's your perceptions and your thoughts and your reflexes, all the all the things that you are aware of from when you receive a stimulus. Um, uh, you know, your perception of that stimulus, your experience of, uh, of that stimulus, all that is an activity of the nervous system uh, up in your brain, all your thoughts and perceptions are. Okay, um, well, so not always, but usually when we, our brain, um, you know, has received nervous stimulation and the brain has come up with a response to it, usually that involves moving muscles, right? For instance, if you feel a bug on your arm, you probably want to move your muscles to brush the bug off your arm. Um, and so, yeah, most of the responses that you're, are formulated in your central nervous system involve sending signals to your muscles. And so let me give the woman a muscle here in her arm. Um, yeah, so the, the response to that bug on her arm is going to be another nervous system signal that's going to come down out of her brain through her spinal cord and arrive at this muscle right here to activate this muscle so she can move her arm to brush the, brush the bug off her other arm right there. Um, and incidentally, those types of signals that come out of the central nervous system to uh, activate your muscles are called motor signals. And we'll see that right here. Here comes the motor signal down out of her brain and her spinal cord and going to the muscle. Now, 
that muscle will contract, you know, the muscle will, will move her arm, and she'll be able to brush that bug off of her arm. And so that, that last bit was another illustration of the nervous system's function of transmitting signals rapidly between body parts, you know, those motor signals that are response signals coming out of the brain and spinal cord that move out and go to your muscles, those are, well, that's rapidly transmitting a signal from one body part, the brain and spinal cord, to another body part, in this case, the muscle. Okay, so just to recap, the functions of the nervous system are sensing stimuli, det detecting things like sights and sounds and touch and tastes and smells, uh, formulating a response to those stimuli, deciding what you're going to do in response to the stimulus, and also transmitting signals rapidly between body parts. For instance, sense signals traveling rapidly from a sense organ up to the brain and motor signals coming down out of the brain uh, to muscles are all examples of uh, the nervous system transmitting, carrying signals rapidly between body parts. Oh, just uh, so you know, when I say that the nervous system carries signals rapidly between body parts, how fast are we talking? On the order of around 200 miles per hour is the speed of, um, of signals that go through your nervous system. Okay, the nervous system organs that you see in this diagram, like her brain and her spinal cord and her nerves, are made out of nervous tissue. And remember that each tissue is made out of a specific cell type. And so let's ask ourselves, well, what are the cell types that you find in nervous tissue? Well, it turns out there are two major cell types that nervous tissue is made out of. One of these cell types is called neurons and the other type are called neuroglial cells. So let's start talking with talking about the neuron cells that you find in nervous tissue. Here's a diagram of a neuron cell. Sometimes they're called nervous uh, nerve cells, but the proper name is a neuron. Uh, you can see it's kind of an odd looking cell, right? Uh, you know, um, it's got these weird it's not a, sort of a standard round looking cell, right? It's, it's very strange looking. Anyway, um, so these uh, neuron cells uh, of nervous tissue, they are the cells of the nervous tissue that performs all the functions of nervous tissue, like detecting stimuli, formulating responses to the stimulus, and carrying electrical signals rapidly between body parts. Uh, it's just the neuron cells of nervous tissue that do those functions. The other cells of neuroglial, uh, the other cells of nervous tissue, the neuroglial cells, do not do any of those functions. Neuroglial cells. Unlike the neuron, you know, neuroglial cells do not sense any stimuli or carry signals between body parts or, or formulate responses. Only the neuron cells do those functions of the nervous tissue. Okay, well, um, let's begin by naming some of the regions of the neuron. The part of the neuron that's more or less round-shaped and that has the nucleus in the middle is called the cell body of the neuron. And if you look in the lecture handout, it says defines it pretty much that way, the round region of the neuron that contains the nucleus and the other major organelles uh, of the neuron. But you can see there are these regions that stick out of the cell body, like here and here and here, and this long skinny part that sticks out of the cell body there. Uh, those can be called pro the processes. The processes, the word process means that stick out of. So those are the processes, the, the extensions that come out of the cell body of the neuron. Uh, so let's begin with these processes at this part uh, of the neuron right here. Uh, those are called the dendrites of the neuron. And, you know, they look a little, little bit like little trees, right? That's actually what dendrites mean. And the other major type of process that comes out of the neuron is this long skinny part right here. That's called the axon of the neuron. Okay, yeah, so two types of processes, the dendrites and the axon. But what do they do? What is their functions for the neuron? Well, the uh, dendrites are the part of the neuron that detects stimulation. So think of them as sort of the sensors or, or the antenna of the of the neuron. So if there's a stimulus, you know, we talked about touch being an example of a stimulus. Um, if there's a stimulus, it's the dendrites that detect it. And once the dendrites have detected a stimulus, they generate a nerve signal, an electrical signal in the in the um, uh, in the neuron. And as you can see, the nerve signal then runs down from the dendrites through the cell body and eventually along the axon. Which brings me to the axon. What's the function of the axon? Um, its job is to carry that 
electrical signal, that nerve signal rapidly between body parts. Eventually, the axon delivers the nerve signal to what's called the target cell. The target cell is whatever cell is going to receive that nerve signal from, from this neuron. Okay, uh, yeah, so the, that's why the axon is long and skinny. It's sort of like, a, I don't know, a bit of computer wire. It's, its job is to carry an electrical signal um, you know, from one body part to another and eventually delivering that signal to the target cell, which is not, the target cell is not shown in this diagram, but the target cell would be right here. The target cell, again, is the cell that the uh, neuron passes its signal to. Okay, so dendrites, their job is to detect the stimulus and generate an electrical signal, and the axon's job is to carry that electrical signal between body parts, eventually delivering it to uh, the target cell for the electrical signal. Okay, uh, very good. Um, notice at the end of the axon is kind of a bulb-shaped region right there. Uh, that is called the axon terminal, and basically it, it, it helps to uh, pass the signal onto the target cell. Now, notice in this cartoon of the neuron that I'm making, I'm only showing one axon terminal here at the end of the axon. In real life, it's a little more complicated. In real life, neurons often have several axon terminals uh, all branching uh, from the end of the neuron, like you see here. And w when a neuron have, has those, we call those collaterals. So this neuron in the cartoon actually has three collaterals. And like I said, most neurons actually have several collaterals. But just to keep my diagram simple, I'm generally not going to show them. Just to keep my diagram simple, I'll just show one axon terminal at the end of the, of the axon. But bear in mind that for most neurons, they actually have several axon terminals because they have several collaterals. All right, very good. Now, um, focusing, our, focusing our attention on the axon again, um, in real life, neurons have a coating of white fatty material all along the axon, and that's, that white fatty material is called myelin, and, and so you call that the myelin sheath uh, of the axon, a, a wrapping of myelin uh, around the axon. And what it does is it helps make the signal go faster. You know the job of the axon is to carry that electrical signal rapidly between body parts and delivering it to the target cell and so the body wants that signal to go as fast as possible uh, the myelin sheath helps speed up th that electrical signal through the axon um, you, just to make an analogy you sometimes if you look at electrical wires all electrical wires are made of copper but they have a coating of rubber on the outside of the wire um, so almost think of the myelin sheath as like the rubber coating on a long, skinny electrical wire. Okay, uh, but to keep my diagram simple, I'm usually not going to show the myelin sheath. And again, you know, when you when I when I show it to you, a neuron like this, just keep in mind that almost always it does have a myelin sheath. But but just to keep my diagram uh, as simple, I'm just usually not going to show it. Okay, um, well, so just to quickly review the. Um, Dendrites, that part of the neuron, it, their job is to detect the stimulus. And when they do, they generate electrical signal that travels through the dendrites in the cell body. Then the electrical nerve signal goes into the axon, and the axon's job is to carry the signal between body parts and deliver it to the target cell. Okay, now, um, up until this point, I've been telling you that the things that stimulate dendrites are sense stimuli, things like touches and tastes and smells and lights and things like that. And that's true for, for many neurons. But for many other neurons, what stimulates their dendrites is not actually a sense stimulus. It's another neuron. And so what I'm saying is oftentimes you find neurons linked together in chains like this. And so um, the dendrites of this neuron right here get stimulated by the nerve signal arriving at the end of this neuron. In other words, this neuron, um, when it has a, a nerve signal, is what stimulates the dendrites of this neuron so that this neuron can have its own, own signal. Otherwise, in other words, oftentimes nerve signals get passed uh, down a chain of neurons. Matter of fact, I think we're going to see that here. There's the first neuron. It has its electrical nerve signal. And then the dendrites of that neuron detected that nerve signal We'll see it again here. The dendrites detected it, and that made this neuron have its own nerve signal.
yeah, so that's kind of a standard thing. Neurons uh, are often um, found in, in, in chains, and the, this neuron, like in the chain, stimulates the dendrites of the next neuron to have its own electrical signal. And then what happens to the electrical, electrical signal after this neuron? Well, it might get passed to another neuron. So you might have the signal going through neuron after neuron after neuron. Uh, oh yeah, okay, so anyway, the dendrites uh, in many neurons are stimulated by another neuron's electrical signal. Now, the junction between two neurons is called the synapse. Oh, sorry, I got, got a little ahead of myself. Um, the, uh, whenever you're talking about a neuron, the cell that the neuron delivers its signal to is called the target cell of the neuron. So this neuron is the target cell of this neuron. Later on in our discussion, we'll see that sometimes the target cell is not another neuron. Sometimes the target cell might be a muscle cell, uh, but oftentimes the target cell of a neuron is another neuron. Well, what I was about to say is the junction between a neuron and its target cell uh, is called the synapse. And so the synapse includes the axon terminal of the neuron and uh, the dendrites of the target cell neuron. So far, we've been focusing on uh, the neurons, and the neurons are the main cell type of nervous tissue. Uh, but there is another category of cells that are also part of nervous tissue. And this other category of cells are called the neuroglial cells. And here I have uh, some cartoons of some of the neuroglial cells. So you can see there's, there's several different types of neuroglial cells. In the um, in the web handout for this lecture, it defines them this way. It says the neuroglial cells are cells that support and assist neurons, but these neuroglial cells do not carry out any of the functions of nervous tissue that we've talked about. So the neuroglial cells do not sense any sense stimuli. They do not um, formulate responses to the stimulus. They do not carry signals rapidly between body parts. It's the neurons who do all those, those three major functions of the nervous tissue. The neuroglial cells are basically there to, to help and assist the neurons, not to do the functions of the neurons. Well, like I said, you can see that there are uh, several types of these neuroglial cells, and each type has its own particular structure, meaning sort of what it looks like, what its shape is, and, uh, and each one has its own particular function. So let's look at some of these, starting with the Schwann cells. Okay, so Schwann cells are only found in the peripheral nervous system. And what they do is they add myelin to uh, the neurons, of the, the neurons there in, in the peripheral nervous system. So remember, myelin is this white fatty material that coats the axons of neurons, and the myelin helps the nerve signal travel faster through the neuron. Well, for neurons in the peripheral nervous system, it's the Schwann cell that adds that myelin to them. Let's look a little more closely at that. Um, in this part of the image right here, this golden rod type thing, represents an axon, and this represents a Schwann cell. So here's the way the Schwann cell adds myelin to an axon. The Schwann cell sticks itself onto the axon, and then it wraps itself several times around the axon, which you can see it's done right here. And once it's done that, the Schwann cell turns itself into myelin. That's where the myelin comes from. Um, for these, for these uh, axons of neurons in the peripheral nervous system, each bit of myelin comes from a Schwann cell that's wrapped itself around the axon. And so the myelin is actually laid down in clumps, right? Because each part, clump of myelin comes from one Schwann cell that's wrapped itself around that part of, of the axon. As a matter of fact, let me get back to this earlier uh, cartoon I showed you of, of a neuron. There's the axon, the long skinny part right there. And yeah, the white coating of the axon is the myelin, but I think I pointed th this out to you before. Notice that the myelin on this axon is laid down in these little lumps, these clumps, and now you know why, because each of those represents one Schwann cell that wrapped itself around the axon and turned itself into, into myelin. Okay, so those are what the Schwann cells do. They add myelin to axons uh, to, of neurons in, in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, what are the oligodendrite neuroglial cells do? Well, they also add myelin to axons, but they do it to the neurons that are inside the central nervous system. Uh, I don't have a cartoon of it, but um, you know, basically the same concept that we saw for the Schwann cell. The oligodendrite cells 
add myelin to the axons of neurons that are inside the uh, the central nervous system. So no, notice that the Schwann cells and the oligodendrite cells, they have the same job to add myelin to axons, but the Schwann cells do it to neurons in the peripheral nervous system, and the oligodendrites do it to neurons in the central nervous system. Okay, well, there's one more neuroglial cell type we're going to talk about, and those are called the astrocytes. Astro means star, and site means cell. And you can see it does you know, sort of look a bit like a star, right? That's where the name comes from. Uh, so what do they do? Well, let me tell you what they don't do. They do not add myelin to axons. That's not the job of the astrocyte. Uh, so what do the astrocytes do? And the short answer is they, um, they give nutrients to the neurons inside the central nervous system. And let me now explain what I mean by that in a little bit more detail. Okay, so um, let's think about most cells in your body. For, for the moment, forget neurons. Just think of most cells in your body. Um, where do they get their nutrients from? Well, you might say, well, from the blood, right? Well, kind of yes and kind of no. Uh, here you see this woman's blood vessels. And let's imagine we're going to zoom in on one of her capillaries. A capillary is a type of blood vessel. So let's imagine we're going to zoom in on a blood vessel right there, the capillary. Here it is right here. And here are um, some of the cells that are near that capillary. Uh, okay, well, so there's this watery liquid called the tissue fluid that surrounds the, the cells of your body. And inside the, the blood vessel right here, uh, inside the capillary, is the blood, of course. And, the, you know, the liquid part of the blood is called the plasma. Okay, well, so the blood carries nutrients. But notice that the wall of the capillary blood vessel is leaky, right? It has a bunch of holes in it. And the purpose of those holes in the capillary is to allow nutrients to leak out of the blood in the blood vessel and go into the tissue fluid. So the answer to the question is where, mo where do most of the cells in your body get their nutrients? Well, they get their nutrients from the tissue fluid, the liquid that surrounds the cells. But the tissue fluid gets its nutrients from... Uh, the blood inside the capillaries. And again, those nutrients can get out of the blood and into the tissue fluid because the capillary blood vessels have lots of these little holes to let the nutrients escape from the blood. Okay, so this is a having the capillary with lots of holes in it is good for providing your cells with nutrients because those holes allow the nutrients to leak out and then go into the tissue fluid so then the cells uh, can get the nutrients. But it's bad at protecting cells from toxins and pathogens that might be carried in your blood. Pathogens are disease-causing organisms like virus, for example, right? Because any toxins or pathogens can also escape through these little holes and potentially uh, harm uh, the cells in your body. Okay, yeah, so the holes in the capillary, good for providing nutrients to cells, but bad for protecting cells from toxins and, and pathogens. All right, um, let's now focus more again on the nervous system and, of course, the, the neurons of the nervous system. And let's uh, focus, use her brain as an example of, uh, uh, of part of the nervous system that has the neuron cells inside of it. Well, you know, your brain is a living organ, so it needs a blood supply also. So these are supposed to be some of the, uh, some of the blood vessels um, uh, in the brain. And let's imagine zooming in on one, just one of those capillaries. Let's say that one right there. Here we go. Here's that capillary. Uh, and so here are some of the neurons of the brain. You can see a bunch of the uh, neurons there in gray of, of the brain. Okay, so what do you notice that's different about that capillary? Doesn't have any holes in it, right? And so that is what's called the blood-brain barrier. In, your, in the lecture handout, it defines it like this. Um, the blood-brain barrier means that the capillaries in the brain, unlike most of the capillaries uh, in other parts of the body, these capillaries in the brain do not have the little holes, and so therefore they do not allow any nutrients or other molecules to exit out of the blood vessel and, and go into um, you know, go into the brain where they can be with these, these neurons. So the blood-brain barrier is, is good because it protects the neurons of your, in your brain from potential toxins and pathogens that might be carried in your blood. But it's bad because it also blocks nutrients from getting out of the capillary, nutrients that, that the neurons inside your brain need. So what's the answer to this dilemma, right? The body wants to protect the neurons of the brain because you know the brain acts as the control center for many other parts of the body. And so yeah, the, the, the body wants to protect the neurons of the brain and so that's why it has this blood-brain barrier. But 
those neurons have to somehow get nutrients, right? And so the answer to this problem is, is the astrocyte cells. Uh, oh, so this just shows some of the nutrients going through the blood in that brain capillary. But like I said, there are no holes in that capillary. That's the blood-brain barrier. So those nutrients can't get to the neurons, which need those nutrients. Okay, so what's the answer? The astrocyte cells. So um, astrocyte, astrocyte cells uh, defined like this, star-shaped neuroglial cells inside the central nervous system, right? We're talking about the brain. So this is uh, these astrocytes are in the central nervous system. Uh, star-shaped cells in the central nervous system that form a bridge between the neurons in the brain and the um, and the blood vessels, though I should say, the capillaries um, that going through the brain. And the job of those astrocytes is to transfer the nutrients from the blood in the capillary to the uh, to the neurons of the brain. So the, the in other words, the astrocytes are able to absorb nutrients right through the wall of the capillary. And I think we're going to see that here. Uh, yeah, so this, well, I think we're going to see it. Here we go, yeah. So this astrocyte grabs a glucose, and the astrocyte can absorb that glucose right through the wall of the capillary. Then once the astrocyte has that glucose, it can then transfer it to, uh, to those neurons in the brain, you know, that need the glucose for energy, like that. And it's not just glucose. Um, all of the uh, nutrient types in the blood uh, the astrocyte is able to absorb through the wall of the capillary, and then um, and then transfer to the uh, uh, to the neurons of the brain. Okay, very good. So thank you, astrocytes, for uh, safely transferring nutrients to the neurons in our brain, uh, and you know while allowing the blood-brain barrier to protect our, the neurons in our brain from toxins and and pathogens. Okay, so uh, maybe a quick bit of summary here. Um, these astrocytes are found uh, um, only in the central nervous system, you know, in the brain and, and the spinal cord, and they transfer nutrients from the capillaries uh, in the central nervous system to the neurons of the central nervous system. And they are one type of neuroglial cells. These, these neuroglial cells are the cells that are the assistance to the neurons in, in, in the nervous system. And these other two types of neuroglial cells, the Schwann cells and the oligodendrites, their job is to add myelin to the axons of, of neurons. The Schwann cells add myelin to uh, the axons of neurons in the peripheral nervous system, and the oligodendrites add myelin to the axons of neurons in the central nervous system. Okay, so now uh, you have a good understanding of the neuroglial cells of nervous tissue, but let's refocus our attention now on the neuron cells uh, of nervous tissue. In terms of what function a neuron does, there are actually three types of neurons. They are called sensory neurons, interneurons, and motor neurons. And so what I want to do now is go through those three types of neurons, sensory neurons, interneurons, and motor neurons, one at a time, and talk about uh, what the function of each of those three types is. And so we will begin with uh, discussing sensory neurons, and probably a good way to introduce them is um, imagine some sort of uh, touch sense stimulus. So imagine this is a fly, zzz, and let's say it lands on this woman's shoulder and starts walking around on her shoulder. That counts as a touch stimulus, right? Because your skin is the sense organ for, for touch. Okay, so um, the sensory neurons are the neurons um, uh, that detect sense stimuli, and so that the sensory neurons in her the skin of her shoulder are going to detect that touch from the fly, and they're going to generate a nerve signal, a, a sensory nerve signal, which is eventually going to be sent uh, to her spinal cord and then up to her brain. Um, so that's in essence is the job of sensory neurons. They detect sense stimuli then generate a nerve signal, which they send into the central nervous system. Let's zoom in on her shoulder to see that sensory neuron uh, up close a little bit. Here it is right here. Here's the sensory neuron. OK, so in your lecture outline, it defines the sensory neurons like this. It says they are PNS neurons that detect sense stimuli and carry the sense nerve signals into the central nervous system. Okay, so a few things about that definition. Uh, so notice that it says that they are PNS neurons. So sensory neurons are always in your peripheral nervous system. They are not in your central nervous system. They detect sense stimuli. And so what are the sense stimuli? Those are things like 
touches and light and sounds and tastes and smells, basically the types of stimuli uh, that you can sense. And when a sensory neuron does get stimulated by a sense stimulus, in other words, uh, when it detects a sense stimulus, its job is to generate a nerve signal that we call a sensory nerve signal, and it sends that sensory nerve, nerve signal uh, into the peripheral nervous system. Now, why do they pass their signals into the peripheral nervous system? Well, because your brain is in your peripheral nervous system. Here's the brain up here. And for you to be consciously aware of the sense stimulus, you know, for you to feel the touch or, or, or see the sight or taste, taste the, the taste, um, those nerve signals have to, have to reach your brain because that's where your consciousness is. Okay, now, um, so notice that the sensory uh, neuron has a kind of a different shape than most of the neurons that uh, I've been telling you about. I mean, it certainly still has a cell body. You can see it right there. And that part right there is the axon. Uh, you know, it comes out of the cell body and goes to the, uh, goes to the axon terminal right there. But notice what's different. On most neurons that I've been showing you so far, the dendrites stick right out of the cell body, right? But in sensory neurons, they don't. For sensory neurons, there's a different process, different from the axon, and the dendrites are at the end of that uh, process. Um, neurons of, of this shape are called unipolar um, uh, shaped neurons. Um, and you might wonder, well, why do sensory neurons have this strange unipolar shape, you know, different from most neurons? Well, I don't know. It's just part of the anatomy of sensory neurons. But anyway, if you see a neuron that has this unipolar shape, uh, again, what it means is where the dendrites do not stick right out of the cell body of the neuron. The dendrites have their own process, their own extension, and they're found at the end of that extension. If you, if you see a neuron that has that unipolar shape, guaranteed it's a sensory neuron. All sensory neurons have that unipolar shape. Okay, so uh, the sensory neurons, uh, part of their job is to detect the sense stimulus. And each uh, in each of your sensory organs, the sensory neurons uh, dendrites are tuned to detect just the sense stimulus of that particular organ. So for instance, in your skin, which is your sense organ for a touch, the dendrites of the sensory neurons are, are designed to detect touch stimulus. And so let's see that in action. Let's say, uh, oh, that didn't work. Let me go back one second. Where is that touch stimulus? Sorry. There it is. Uh, so, yeah, when the dendrites of that um, uh, sensory neuron in the skin d get stimulated by a touch stimulus, then the sensory neuron generates its uh, electrical nerve signal, its, its uh, sense signal, and it sends that into the central nervous system. Uh, but as I was saying, in, in your different sense organs, the sensory neurons are tuned to whatever the stimulus is that's appropriate for that sense organ. So let me give you some other examples. Uh, so if we zoom in... Um, here on her uh, face, and let's say she's going to smell a flower, right? Uh, the sensory neurons inside her uh, nasal cavity um, are designed to detect smells as their sense stimulus. As a matter of fact, I think we're going to zoom in now. Here it is. Yeah, here's a sensory neuron in her nasal cavity, and the den yeah, its dendrites are uh, stimulated by smell molecules, which are molecules dissolved in the air. And uh, when they detect some of those smell molecules, then, well, the sensory neuron generates an electrical sense uh, signal, and it carries that into the central nervous system. And let's do another one. Um, inside your oral cavity, you know, your mouth, um, that's where your sense of taste is centered. And so the sensory neurons in your oral cavity, their dendrites are stimulated by uh, taste molecules. The, uh, the molecules in your foods, like salts and sugars, is what they detect. And when they do detect them, then they generate uh, an electrical sensory nerve signal and, again, deliver it into your CNS. And let's do another one. Um, you know, here is your, uh, this is supposed to be a sensory neuron in your ear. And so uh, it gets stimulated by sounds. And when it does detect them, it generates an electrical nerve signal and delivers it into your, into your CNS. And let's do the eyes now. Um, the uh, sensory neurons in your eyes um, their dendrites are stimulated by light, and so when they detect light, they they generate an electrical nerve signal and, and send it uh, into your uh, into your central nervous system. Okay, so uh, I think you get the idea. These sensory neurons they detect sense stimuli, and in response, they 
generate an electrical nerve signal and send it into the CNS. Okay, so those are the sensory neurons. The next uh, of the three types of neurons are the interneurons, uh, which are sometimes called uh, association neurons. Uh, so if you look at the definition in the lecture handout, it tells you that the interneurons are neurons inside the central nervous system. Let me freeze the action here. There we go. So look at all those neurons that are inside the uh, brain and spinal cord. So just by definition, they are interneurons. Uh, so yeah, so the inter the, again, the neurons that are inside your CNS are called the interneurons. And what do the interneurons do? Well, for one thing, they receive the sense signals that come from the sensory, um, uh, the sensory neurons. And we'll see that here uh, with this um, sensory neuron in the eye. Remember, it gets stimulated. Oh, so yeah, those are the interneurons, you know that. Here we go, it gets stimulated by light, and so it generates its sense signal, and then it passes, that sensory neuron passes that sense signal into the interneurons inside the CNS, and, um, well, so that's one thing that the interneurons do. They receive sense signals from, um, from your sensory neurons out in the PNS. But notice that once the interneurons get those signals, get, get those sensory signals, they, uh, the interneurons start communicating back and forth with each other. And uh, that's what you experience as your perceptions and your feelings and your emotions and your thoughts. Your, your perceptions and your thoughts and your feelings are the interneurons uh, in your brain and spinal cord, but especially those in your brain uh, sending nerve signals back and forth to each other. Now, one thing that results from these interneurons sending signals back and forth to each other is that you decide on what your response to the stimulus is going to be, right? You know, if you feel uh, the bug crawling on your shoulder, you're probably going to decide to, that the, the response is you want to brush the bug off of your shoulder, right? Yeah, so typically uh, the response that your interneurons come up with um, it will involve using muscles, right? Uh, like to, yeah, to brush off the bug. Okay, so the way it works is like this. The, the interneurons um, will generate a, a response nerve signal that's going to be sent to the muscles. And we call that a, a motor signal. A motor signal is a nerve signal that's eventually going to be uh, sent to the muscles. And so when the uh, neurons, the interneurons generate that motor signal, uh, it typically goes down the spine like you see here. There it goes, down the spine, and then it eventually... Uh, leaves the spine and goes to the muscle or muscles involved and well then the muscles carry out the action and that uh, is there is the response you know like brushing the bug off the arm uh, but here's the thing um, those interneurons you know where the uh, motor signal first started they're inside the cns right but the muscle is outside of the cns you know it's it's the muscle is not in the brain or spinal cord and so there has to be some neurons outside the CNS that carry that motor signal to the muscle. And so let's, that's called a motor neuron. So that's the last of our three types of neurons. Let's uh, zoom in and we'll, we'll see that there. Okay, so here's her spine right here and there are some interneurons in her spine that, that you know, carry that motor signal down the spine. And here's that muscle. But yeah, there's got, the, the motor neurons are the neurons that, uh, you can see them right here, that, that carry the, the nerve signals and the, the motor nerve signals out of the CNS and actually deliver them uh, to the muscles. Okay, so that's, um, yeah, in your, in your lecture hound out, it gives that definition for motor neurons, which are sometimes called efferent neurons. They are PNS neurons that conduct response motor signals out of the CNS. So notice, uh, again, that motor uh, neurons are, are PNS neurons. They're, they're not in the brain and spinal cord, uh, and their job is, is to... Um, uh, carry those motor signals out of the CNS and to deliver them to the muscles. Okay, so notice that uh, motor neurons get their motor signals from interneurons inside the CNS, like this interneuron here is going to hand the motor signal uh, to the motor neuron, and then the signal will pass through the motor neuron and get delivered uh, to, to the muscle. Okay, now um, I think we're going to see that in action. And here comes that motor signal down the spine and then it passes from those interneurons into the spine into the motor neuron and away it goes and stimulates the muscle and then the muscle contracts and she's able to carry out the response you know brushing the bug off of her shoulder 
Okay, now, um, in the cartoon that we just saw, that motor signal was passed by just one motor neuron, you know, from the CNS to the muscle. In some cases, instead of one motor neuron, each motor signal passes through a series of two motor neurons uh, to get to the muscle. Um, so hopefully you'll find that you find that kind of interesting. Like, huh? Well, why in one case is, does just one motor neuron carry each signal to the muscle, and in other cases there's a series of two motor neurons that carry the signal to the muscle? Well, we'll talk about that later on um, in this lecture. But just realize in some cases, yeah, each signal motor signal passes through two motor neurons, and in other cases, um, just one motor neuron carries the signal from the CNS uh, to the muscle. Okay, so so far I've been emphasizing the role of these motor neurons in carrying motor signals that get delivered to muscles, and that's what most motor neurons do. Um, but some motor neurons uh, pass their signals to what are called glands. A, a gland is any structure in the body that secretes substances. For instance, your sweat glands are glands because they secrete sweat. And in another place in your body, you have adrenal glands that secrete adrenaline when you're angry or frightened. And uh, what's another good example? In your uh, mouth, you have salivary glands that secrete saliva. And in your digestive organs, you have um, glands that secrete acids to help digest your food. Anyway, so a gland is any structure in the body that secretes substances. And as it turns out, um, glands get their signals to tell them when to secrete substances from motor neurons. Here we go. Yeah, so some motor neurons carry signals from the CNS and deliver them to glands to get those glands to secrete the substances. But don't let that distract you from the fact that most motor neurons uh, deliver um, signals to, to muscles, not to glands. Oh yeah, so there's a picture of a... Uh, motor signal being delivered to uh, that gland by that motor neuron up there. But like I said, most neuro motor neurons uh, deliver their signals to muscles, not glands. All right, well, um, to sort of review what we learned about the three types of neurons, sensory neurons, interneurons, and motor neurons, um, we're going to have kind of a scenario. Let's imagine that we ask this woman to read from this book aloud, all right? And we're going to, we're going to see the interplay of the sensory neurons, the interneurons, and the motor neurons for her to do that task of reading the book aloud. Okay, so she, um, you know, visually she first looks at the words in the book, and so that's going to be a light stimulus, right? And uh, it's the uh, sensory neurons in her eyes that detect light stimuli. Right, you see it there, and in response, they generate an electrical nerve signal, a, a sense signal, and they pass that inward into the motor neurons inside her CNS, inside her brain, as you can see here, and then the uh, motor neurons, um, sorry, the motor, the interneurons in her CNS then receive that signal, and start sending signals back and forth to each other, and that is her processing the stimulus. That's her being aware of the words. Um, and, and deciding um, what the meaning of the words are, and, and then eventually the response is going to be sending a signal to her uh, jaw muscle and other muscles that allow her to speak, because remember that what she wants to do is read the words aloud, and so um, there'll have to be a motor neuron for that. Yeah, so eventually some of these interneurons will generate motor signals, and those motor signals will be passed to the motor neuron, which will deliver them to her jaw muscles and the other muscles that she uses for speaking. And she'll be able to do the appropriate response, which in this case is to read the words aloud. Okay, so hopefully you have a good sense of uh, the three uh, the three types of neurons uh, in terms of neuron function, sensory neurons, interneurons, and motor neurons. As you can see from this animation here, uh, there's a constant interplay of the sensory neurons, the interneurons, and the motor neurons whenever you're doing pretty much any activity. Okay, um, so we're going to now switch uh, to a new topic, uh, the topic of nerves. So let me go to this illustration. Um, so notice in this illustration you can see her her CNS, you know, the brain and the spinal cord in kind of a light yellow, but notice branching out of the CNS, you know, in other words, out here in the PNS are all these um, sort of slightly darker yellow structures. Um, those are nerves. And so what nerves are, um, are bundles of 
neurons in the PNS. And of course, remember, the neurons we find in the PNS are sensory neurons and motor neurons. And so yeah, the, in the PNS, uh, those sensory mo neurons and motor neurons are often bundled together, and we, uh, we call those nerves. And to see one of these, let's, let's imagine we could zoom in on just one of those nerves right there. Here it is. Okay, yeah, you see some sensory neurons there, and you see some motor neurons there. And so together, since they're bundled together there, we say that that's a nerve right there. Okay, um, so in the, in the lecture handout, it says that, that nerves are uh, bundles of neurons in the PNS. Now, uh, nerves are always wrapped in a protective layer of dense connective tissue, so let me add that in. That's what the yellowish coloring uh, right there is. All right, so that's uh, my cartoon of a nerve. Um, so notice this nerve that I'm showing um, contains both types of PNS neurons. It has sensory neurons and motor neurons. And uh, nerves that are like that, that have both uh, sensory neurons and motor neurons are called mixed nerves. So you're looking at a mixed nerve here because it has both types. And of course, you remember that the sensory neurons, their job is to carry um, sense signals into the CNS and the motor neurons their job is to carry motor signals out of the CNS uh, like you see there. Um, so all nerves connect to the CNS they have to right so that the um, sense nerve signals can be delivered into the CNS and the motor nerve signals can be brought out out of the CNS. Okay now um, although most nerves in your body are mixed nerves like you see here there are a few nerves that are only uh, that contain only only sensory neurons and just to give you an example of that let's zoom in on our head here we see a, a nerve it's called the optic nerve that comes out of her eye and delivers um, uh, sensory signals, uh, vision sensory signals uh, into her into her brain. So the optic nerve is only made out of sensory neurons. There are no motor neurons there. So most nerves are mixed nerves, uh, but a few nerves uh, are not mixed. Uh, a few nerves have only only sensory neurons in them. Okay, uh, so all nerves connect to the connect to the CNS. All nerves. Um, have a connection to the CNS. You know, just like, to make an analogy, just like all the branches of a tree um, connect to the main branch of the tree, right? But there are actually uh, two types of nerves depending on where they connect to the CNS. Uh, the nerves that connect to the CNS in the head, in other words, the nerves that connect to the uh, CNS, the brain, are called cranial nerves and the nerves that connect to the CNS in the spinal cord are called spinal nerves. So all of these are spinal nerves, and what you see around here are cranial nerves. Uh, so notice the spinal nerves always come in pairs, like if there's one coming out here towards the right side of our body, there's a, another one coming out to the left there, so that they are a pair of spinal nerves. And you can see the same thing right here. Uh, for this spinal nerve coming out of the spine right here to her right side, there's the mirror image one coming out of her spine to the left. So all, all spinal nerves um, always come in pairs. Let's uh, return to looking at one of these uh, nerves right here. Here it is a close-up again. As you can see, this one's a mixed nerve the way most nerves are. But the point I'm making here is, is this. Notice that right here in the nerve, there's a cluster of neuron cell bodies. Remember, the cell body of the neuron is the, the round part that has the nucleus and, and other organelles in it. Well, wherever in a nerve you find a cluster of, of, the, uh, of the neuron cell bodies, like you see there, uh, that's called a ganglion. If you look at your web handout, it, it defines it like this. A ganglion is a cluster of neuron cell bodies within a nerve, you know, and nerves are in, the P, are in the PNS, right? Okay. Um, now, uh, so this ganglion that I'm showing here um, is uh, made up of the cell bodies of some of the, uh, the, the sensory neurons in, in the nerve. Um, so that, that's what forms some ganglia, are, for, are the sensory neuron cell bodies. But looking at the motor neuron, I think I mentioned a little earlier that in some cases, here we go, um, in some cases motor signals are carried by two motor neurons in a row 
In other words, in some cases, uh, one motor neuron within the nerve will synapse with another motor neuron, like you see there. And so notice that when you have that sort of arrangement where each signal motor signal is carried by two motor neurons, you're also going to have a cluster of cell bodies. In this case, it's the motor neuron cell bodies that are all clustered together right there at the synapse between the motor neurons. And so that also counts as a ganglion also. Uh, so the point here is that anywhere within a nerve where you have a cluster of cell bodies uh, of the neurons is called a ganglion. And because the cell body is a much wider part of the neuron than the axon is. You know, the axon is, is, is skin, the skinny part. Because the cell bodies are wider than the axon, ganglia make a visible bulge in the, um, in the, uh, the dense connective tissue of the nerve. In other words, if you're looking at a nerve even from the outside, you can see ganglia as a bulgy part of the nerve. Here's a photograph. Um, this is the spinal cord. I'm not sure. It might be from a mouse. I, I don't know exactly. And here you see some spinal nerves branching off of the uh, spinal cord. But notice that they have these bulgy parts. So this is a ganglion in this uh, spinal cord. Uh, sorry, in this, sorry, in this spinal nerve. And right on this spinal nerve, you see there's sort of a bulgy part right there. So there's a ganglion. It looks like there's another uh, ganglion right there. Um, okay, yeah, so these ganglia are, are uh, bundles uh, of of cell bodies within the nerve. Okay, uh, so just by definition, nerves are in the peripheral nervous system. Let's see, yeah, so uh, just by definition, nerves are in the peripheral nervous system. And likewise, the, the ganglion, since those are inside of nerves, um, are also in the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, in the brain and the spinal cord, you find structures that are exactly like nerves and ganglia. But in the CNS, they don't call them nerves and ganglia. Uh, in the nerve, in the central nervous system, they have different terms for them. So let me show those. So let's imagine that we zoom in, uh, let's say, on her brain. Here we go. So you know, here's a bunch of neurons all bundled together. So you'd say, well, that's a nerve, right? Well, no, because it's inside the CNS, we don't call it a nerve. Inside the CNS, the bundled together neurons are called a tract. And so here is a tract inside the brain. Um, and it's not just the brain in the CNS that has tracts. You also find tracts in the spinal cord. Uh, here is what they call a descending tract, a bundle of neurons in her CNS that's going uh, down the spinal cord is a descending tract. And here's an ascending tract, um, a bundle of neurons in her CNS. This it's an, it's an ascending tract because it's going up the spinal cord. Good, yeah, so the bundled together uh, neurons inside the CNS are called a tract. They're not called a nerve. And the cluster of cell bodies um, that you find um, in a tract, they're, they're not called a ganglion. Uh, that term is only res is reserved for um, the clusters of cell bodies in, in the PNS. Inside the CNS, you call the cluster of cell bodies a, a nucleus. The plural is nuclei. So here is a nucleus in her brain, and here's another nucleus, looks like at the junction of the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, yeah, so uh, just to summarize, um, bundles of neurons together, if they're in the PNS, are called a nerve, but if they're in the central nervous system, they're called a tract. And the clusters of cell bodies, if you find them in the PNS, um, they are called a ganglia, a ganglion. Uh, but if you find them inside the central nervous system, they are called a, a, a nucleus. Okay, in the CNS and also in the PNS, Neurons are often found in series with each other. In other words, uh, oftentimes you find neurons forming chains with each other, where, where you, see, you see one neuron right here, and then it's right next to the next neuron. Uh, so this allows them to pass their nerve signals uh, to each other. OK, uh, so when the first neuron uh, has its nerve signal, uh, that neuron's goal is to pass the nerve signal on to uh, the next neuron. And we would say that this neuron right here is the target cell of this neuron. Whatever cell a neuron is, is passing its, its signal to is the target cell of that neuron. Yeah, so for this neuron, this neuron is its target cell. Uh, anyway, so yeah, when we find neurons together like this you know, in a chain, um, each neuron is trying to pass its nerve signal onto the target cell.
uh, you know, the, the next neuron in the chain. Now, the junction between the neuron and its target cell. In other words, this zone right here has a name. It's called it's called the synapse. So the synapse, if you look at your lecture uh, outline, it says the synapse is the location where a neuron passes its signal, passes the nerve signal uh, to its target cell. And again, the target cell is just the cell that's going to be receiving the signal, which as you can see here is usually is usually a, a another neuron. Okay, um, well, there's some terminology about the, the the cells that you find there at the synapse the cell the neuron that's bringing the nerve signal into the synapse is called the presynaptic cell and the neuron that receives the nerve signal uh, from the synapse is called the postsynaptic cell uh, it's sometimes called the target cell um, uh, um, the postsynaptic cell can be sometimes called the target cell, but uh, the, the the more proper name is that it is the postsynaptic cell. Okay, presynaptic cell is the one that uh, is uh, brings the signal to the synapse, and the postsynaptic cell is the cell that uh, is after the synapse. And yeah, the postsynaptic cell is oftentimes uh, a neuron. In some cases, it's a muscle cell. In some cases, a neuron might deliver its signal through the synapse to a muscle cell. But yeah, in most cases, the postsynaptic cell is, is another neuron. Okay, and when the, uh, the goal of the synapse, so to speak, is for the electrical signal to be passed uh, from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell, so that the postsynaptic cell can then deliver the signal to other body parts. Okay, uh, so the synapse includes the axon terminal of the presynaptic cell, and the synapse also includes the dendrites of the postsynaptic cell, but the um, synapse also includes what's called the synaptic cleft. Uh, the synaptic cleft right there is the little gap between the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell. That little space right there is, this, is the synaptic cleft. So just to repeat, the synapse includes the axon terminal of the presynaptic cell, the dendrites of the postsynaptic cell, and the synaptic cleft. Okay, so remember that the, the, the goal of the synapse, so to speak, is to have the, um, the nerve signal pass from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell, but there's a problem. Um, electrical nerve signals can't pass across the synaptic cleft. The electrical nerve signal can't spark across the synaptic cleft. So you might be wondering, well, how does the nerve signal get from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell? Well, I'm glad you asked, even though you didn't. And here's the answer. Uh, so yeah, the, that that nerve signal in the presynaptic cell can't just spark across to the postsynaptic cell. Uh, to get the nerve signal to pass from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell, what happens is the presynaptic cell uses molecules called neurotransmitters. Uh, it, it secretes molecules called neurotransmitters, and the neurotransmitters diffuse across the synaptic cleft and, and cause the postsynaptic cell to have its own uh, electrical nerve signal. So that's how nerve signals get across the synapse by means of these uh, neurotransmitter mo uh, molecules. So let's talk about uh, the neurotransmitters and, and how they get across the synaptic cleft in a little bit more detail. Let's zoom in on the uh, synapse to see what's going on there a little better. All right, so here's the axon terminal of the presynaptic uh, neuron, and here are the dendrites of the uh, postsynaptic uh, neuron, and there's the, there's the synaptic cleft, of course. Okay, so uh, yeah, the molecules that are released from the axon terminals of the presynaptic cell uh, and the, the molecules that are released from the presynaptic cell and that carry the electrical signal across the synapse to the postsynaptic cell, we call neurotransmitters. Uh, yeah, in your, in your lecture outline, that's what it says. The neurotransmitters are the molecules released by the axon terminals to carry the signal, the nerve signal, uh, across the synapse to the postsynaptic cell. Okay, so the uh, neurotransmitter molecules are stored inside the, um, uh, the axon terminal of the presynaptic cell inside vesicles. And when we talked about the organelles that you find inside cells, we mentioned vesicles. Vesicles are little round organelles that store materials inside them. 
And so, yeah, that's how the neurotransmitters are stored. They are stored inside uh, vesicles in the axon terminal of the presynaptic cell. And so the, the neurotransmitter molecules just sort of wait there for the um, presynaptic cell to have to have a, a nerve signal. And let's, let's have that happen here. Um, um, oh, actually, bef before, I, before we go on with the uh, nerve signal here, uh, I should have mentioned over here, for the postsynaptic neuron to be able to detect these neurotransmitters when the neurotransmitters are, are secreted, uh, for, the, for the postsynaptic neuron to be able to detect them, that postsynaptic neuron needs receptors uh, for the neurotransmitter. And remember receptor proteins. We talked about these uh, earlier. Let's have a, a, a close-up of one of these receptor proteins. Um, here we go. So here's a cell membrane right there. And so remember, receptor proteins are membrane proteins. They're proteins that you find in the cell membrane. And the job of receptor proteins is to detect molecules that are outside the cell. Each receptor protein has a binding site that's shaped to fit exactly the molecule it's supposed to be detecting. So if this receptor protein is supposed to be detecting this particular molecule, then the binding site of this receptor protein is shaped to exactly fit the molecule it's supposed to be detecting. That's that lock and key specificity. And once a receptor protein has uh, detected by binding to the molecule that it's supposed to be detected, then the uh, receptor protein signals the, the cell, hey, I've detected my molecule. And the cell always has some sort of pre-programmed response. Well, for neurotransmitter receptors, their pre-programmed response is to have their own nerve signal, right? Because that's the goal of these neurotransmitters is to have the uh, postsynaptic cell have its own nerve signal. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, when the these receptors here in the postsynaptic cell bind the neurotransmitters, the goal is for the, um, um, for the um, postsynaptic cell to have its own uh, electrical nerve signal. Now, um, what I just told you that now is true in general, but there are, in fact, uh, a few types of neurotransmitters that have the opposite effect, effect that actually inhibit the postsynaptic cell from having its own, um, its own um, electrical nerve signal. But I'll talk about those inhibitory neurotransmitters uh, later. Let me just show you these normal ones, which we call excitatory neurotransmitters. Okay, so anyway, the neurotransmitters are stored here inside these vesicles in the axon terminal of the presynaptic cell. And when that presynaptic cell has its electrical nerve signal, uh, eventually that electrical nerve signal uh, winds up there, you know, in the axon terminal. And when that happens, that causes the neurotransmitters that are stored in these vesicles to be secreted out of the presynaptic cell. What happens is these vesicles actually fuse with the cell membrane here, and that dumps these neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. And when I click the button, you'll, you'll see that. Um, but just as a quick review question, does anybody remember the term for where materials that are stored inside a vesicle get exported from the cell when that vesicle fuses with the cell membrane? The term was exocytosis. Yes, yeah, so you can say that when the electrical nerve signal reaches the axon terminal, that causes exocytosis of the neurotransmitters that are stored there in those vesicles. And so let's watch that. Here it goes. The vesicles with the neurotransmitters fuse with the cell membrane that dumps the neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. And then those neurotransmitters start to diffuse across the um, synaptic cleft. And some of them will be able, be able to diffuse into those receptors on the uh, target cell, you know, on the postsynaptic cell. And the pre-programmed response um, for these receptors on the target cell, the pre-programmed response of the cell is to have its own nerve signal, uh, like, like you see there. Oh, yeah, so that's how the nerve signal crosses the synapse. It doesn't spark across. Uh, when the nerve signal reaches the end of the presynaptic cell, it causes the presynaptic cell to um, secrete neurotransmitters into the synapse. The postsynaptic cell has neurotransmitter receptors that when they bind those neurotransmitters, uh, that causes the postsynaptic cell to have its own uh, electrical nerve signal inside of it like that. And then that will, you know, run down the uh, th through the postsynaptic cell. Uh, now, before I go on, uh, like I said a mo moment ago, 
what I showed you here is true for most neurotransmitters. Most neurotransmitters, their goal is to get the postsynaptic cell to have its own electrical signal. Uh, and we call those excitatory uh, neurotransmitters because their goal is to excite the postsynaptic cell into having a nerve signal. But there are a few neurotransmitters that are called inhibitory neurotransmitters whose goal is just the opposite. With inhibitory neurotransmitters, their goal is to stop the postsynaptic cell from having a nerve signal. But those inhibitory ones are sort of the exception to the rule. Most neurotransmitters uh, are excitatory neurotransmitters, just, just what you've seen here. Okay, so here's our zoomed out view. Remember what we talked about earlier, it's fairly typical to have neurons in, in a series like this, you know, in a chain, where one neuron's goal is to uh, pass the nerve signal on to uh, the next neuron in the chain, uh, but the the remember that the electrical nerve signal can't cross the synapse, and so when the electrical nerve signal in the presynaptic cell gets to the axon terminal, what actually happens is the axon terminal secretes uh, neurotransmitters into the synapse, those bind to the receptors in the postsynaptic cell, and the binding of the neurotransmitters to the receptors in the postsynaptic cell causes the postsynaptic cell to have its own nerve signal, and that travels down there. And what will happen next is oftentimes this postsynaptic cell uh, will release its own neurotransmitters and will have its own uh, target cell, just like you see there. Okay, very good. So I think the cartoon just sort of goes on a, a, a loop here. There we go. Okay, now... Uh, I want to make a, a point here. Those neurotransmitters, as soon as they've cost, crossed the synapse, the, the, those neurotransmitters have to be removed from the synapse as quickly as possible. Now, why, why is that important? Well, if those neurotransmitters were to just stay there, stuck onto those receptors, then this target cell would just keep signaling and signaling and signaling, right? And that wouldn't be good. Um, you know, for instance, if this target cell right here were signaling a muscle cell, that means that once it started signaling that muscle cell, for the rest of your life, that mu that muscle cell would be getting signals from that uh, uh, from that neuron, and you know, then that muscle cell would be contracted for the rest of your life. So the point I'm making here is that uh, those neurotransmitters have to be destroyed uh, very quickly as soon as they've crossed the synapse, so that the target cell doesn't get stuck. Uh, just having an electrical signal over and over and over again. So, you know, how do these get? How do these neurotransmitters get removed from the synapse? Well, let's zoom in there. Um, there are various ways. Uh, one way is this: that the presynaptic cell has enzymes that break down, that break apart the neurotransmitters. You can see that going on here to quickly get rid of them. The uh, postsynaptic cell also has enzymes that break down the neurotransmitters. Good. So that so those enzymes breaking down the neurotransmitters um, goes a long way towards removing those neurotransmitters from the synapse after the after the signal is passed across. There's another strategy for also removing those neurotransmitters, and it's called reuptake. In reuptake, the presynaptic cell is able to pull back in. The unused neurotransmitters, and they just go back into vesicles. They 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 bud inward. The membrane buds inward, uh, form some new vesicles inside the presynaptic cell. And does anybody rem remember the name for that process, where molecules come into a cell by budding the membrane inward and forming vesicles inside? And you're right. That process is called endocytosis. Uh, yeah, so when the endocytosis is to bring neurotransmitters back into the presynaptic cell, we call that reuptake of the neurotransmitters. Well, to summarize uh, some things about neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters are these molecules that carry the nerve signal across the synapse. And so obviously neurotransmitters are very important to the proper functioning of your nervous system. And uh, for that reason, we want to look a little bit closer at these neurotransmitter molecules. And the first thing I want you to know about the neurotransmitters is that there are many different types of neurotransmitters. Uh, for instance, you know, here we have this diagram of like sensory neurons here and interneurons here and motor neurons there. Uh, so let's say that this sensory neuron has detected some sort of stimulus, so it's going to release some neurotransmitters 
to pass its uh, sensory signal into this interneuron right there. There's the electrical signal, yeah, so it secretes its, its uh, some neurotransmitters to stimulate this interneuron. But as it turns out, the interneurons here might use a completely different neurotransmitter. Um, Right there, right there, yeah, it's a different neurotransmitter than the sensory uh, neuron uh, secreted. And, you know, eventually the signal um, passes into a, a motor neuron, and the neurotransmitters that that motor neuron uh, uses to stimulate the muscle cell down here might yet be a completely different type of neurotransmitter, different than the ones that the, uh, that the sensory neuron secreted and different from the ones that this interneuron uh, secreted. As a matter of fact, interneurons in different regions of the brain can use different neurotransmitters from each other. Like maybe in this region of the brain, they use that neurotransmitter, but in this region of the brain, the neurons use a different neurotransmitter. And in another region of the brain, the interneurons use a different neurotransmitter uh, still. So the point is that there are many different types of neurotransmitters. And the different types of neurons, like sensory neurons and motor neurons and interneurons, use use different types from each other. Okay, um, for, so even though there are many different types of neurotransmitters that neurons use, uh, I should say that there are many different types of neurotransmitters that are used throughout your nerv nervous system, each individual neuron only secretes one particular type of neurotransmitter, like this particular um, uh, a sensory neuron right here would only ever secrete just one type of neurotransmitter, the one that I'm showing there. And this particular um, motor neuron would only ever secrete just one type of neurotransmitter, the type that I'm showing there. And these interneurons right here uh, would only ever secrete just one type of neurotransmitter, this, uh, well, this kind of red ones I'm showing there. Um, yeah, so, so the nervous system as a whole uses many different neuro neurotransmitters, but any one neuron only secretes one uh, type of neurotransmitter. Okay, so what we want to do now is, is talk about, well, what are these different types of neurotransmitters? And here is a diagram that shows um, uh, seven of the most common types of neurotransmitters. Okay, so you don't have to know their structures. I, I, on a quiz or a midterm, I'm not going to ask you to draw the structure of norepinephrine or the structure of dopamine or, or any of these. You don't have to know their structures, but I do want you to know their names. Uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, glutamic acid, uh, GABA, and, and endorphin. Uh, so I do want you to know their names. I want you to know where they are used, like are they used in the PNS, are they used in the CNS, or are they used in both the PNS and the CNS? And I want you to know their actions, what sort of activities in, in, the, in the nervous system uh, do they do. Okay, we'll start off with acetylcholine, this uh, one right here. If you look at the, um, uh, at the uh, lecture outline, uh, it lists acetylcholine uh, is used both in the PNS and in the CNS. But for the, that being said, for the most part, it's used in the PNS. And uh, for the most part, it's used by motor neurons to, uh, to stimulate their, the, 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 their target cell muscles. And so let's do a little review. So if you want to um, have a muscle contract, like let's say she wants to contract this arm muscle right here, uh, parts of the brain generate signals called motor signals. And those motor signals you know, start off in the brain, but the motor signals are eventually passed to motor neurons in the PNS, and then those motor neurons stimulate the muscle cell uh, to contract, like you see there. Okay, uh, so yeah, so what I'm saying is the general use of acetylcholine is to cause, uh, is used by motor neurons. It's the neurotransmitter secreted by motor neurons uh, to get muscles to contract. Now, at this point, I have to stop and clarify a little bit. There are actually subcategories of muscle cells, and some muscles and their cells are called voluntary muscles. And voluntary muscles are muscles that you can choose when they contract or when they relax. You know, so think about the muscles in their arms, right? You can choose 
when you flex your arm or, or, or relax your arm. So those are voluntary muscles and the muscles in your legs and in your fingers and in your neck and in your face, you know, all of those muscles you can, you choose when they contract or relax. And so those are all voluntary muscles. And so what I'm saying is that it's the motor neurons that control voluntary muscles, um, that use, um, acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. Let's look at that a little bit more closely. And so here's a, a voluntary muscle in her arm. Here's the motor neuron that carries uh, signals to that uh, voluntary muscle. And here we see some interneurons in the spine that will carry motor signals down to that motor neuron. Here's a motor signal. It passes out of the CNS into the motor neuron. Then the motor neuron uh, releases acetylcholine. And the acetylcholine causes voluntary muscles to contract, like you see there. Very good. Okay, yeah, so for uh, voluntary muscles, um, the motor neurons that control them uh, use acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter that causes the, the voluntary muscle to contract. Now, uh, not all muscles in your body are voluntary muscles. There are uh, a different type of class of muscle called involuntary muscles that you don't have conscious control over. But involuntary muscles, yes, they can contract or relax, but your body does that for you. You don't have conscious control over them. And just to give an example, um, these are some blood vessels right here. And there, there's actually um, involuntary muscle in the walls of your blood vessels. Sometimes your body might contract that muscle in the walls of your blood vessels. Sometimes it might relax it, but you can't consciously do that. And so that's involuntary muscle. And to give another example, here are her digestive system organs, like her stomach and her small intestine, her large intestine. The walls of those digestive system organs also have involuntary muscles in them. And so, you know, those muscles contract and relax, but she doesn't have conscious control over relaxing or, or contracting those um, muscles in her digestive organs. So those are also involuntary muscles. And one last example, you can kind of see it here. This is her heart. The heart muscle is also involuntary. You know, you can't consciously make your heart contract. You can't consciously relax your heart, you know, stop it from contracting. Um, uh, so it's involuntary muscle also. And so the point I'm making now is that the motor neurons that control involuntary muscle, at least some of the motor neurons that control involuntary mus muscles, also use acetylcholine um, on those muscles. But here's the weird thing. Um, the response of involuntary muscles to acetylcholine, in some cases, acetylcholine will contract an involuntary muscle in some organs, but in other organs, the involuntary muscle will relax in response to acetylcholine. Uh, so just to summarize, if you're talking about the effect of acetylcholine on voluntary muscles, acetylcholine always contracts voluntary muscles. But if you're talking about the effects of acetylcholine on involuntary muscles, it really depends on what organ you're talking about. With some organs, acetylcholine contracts the involuntary muscle, and with other organs, acetylcholine relaxes the involuntary muscle. Okay, so that's acetylcholine. Uh, the next neurotransmitter we're going to talk about is called norepinephrine. Um, as you can see from the web handout, it's uh, used uh, in the peripheral nervous system and also in the central nervous system, uh, but it's mostly used in the peripheral nervous system, and it's, uh, it's used to control uh, involuntary muscles again. So, you know, just to recap, like the heart muscle is involuntary and uh, muscle and the muscle in your blood vessels is involuntary muscle and the muscle in the walls of your digestive system organs. Those are all examples of involuntary muscles. And yeah, so uh, norepinephrine also um, is, a is a neurotransmitter that controls those involuntary muscles. Now, you might have said, wait a minute, didn't you just tell us that acetylcholine uh, controls those involuntary muscles? Well, um, oftentimes the involuntary muscles can be controlled both by acetylcholine and norepinephrine. The uh, involuntary muscles have receptors for both those neurotransmitters. And oftentimes, interestingly, those two neurotransmitters have opposite effects. For instance, uh, if acetylcholine causes a certain organ's involuntary muscle to contract, then norepinephrine will cause that organ's involuntary muscle to relax. Or if a certain, if one of those uh, neurotransmitters causes the heart uh, muscle to contract harder, the other neurotransmitter will cause it to uh, contract uh, less strongly. So yeah, both acetylcholine and norepinephrine can control 
the involuntary muscles of the body, but almost always they have antagonistic effects on each other. Remember, antagonistics means opposing effects on each other. Kind of interesting. All right. Uh, well, another neurotransmitter I want you to know about is called uh, dopamine. Um, it's used only by neurons inside the CNS. Um, and the, the neurons that generate motor signals uh, use dopamine. So remember, motor signals are nerve signals that um, eventually get passed on to uh, muscles to, um, uh, you know, to uh, control those muscles, to, act, uh, to contract those muscles. And uh, yeah, so the, the, the motor signals are, are originally generated inside the brain, and then those motor signals exit the CNS and go through motor neurons, and then the motor neurons deliver those motor signals to the muscle, and you get contraction of the muscle. Um, oh, quick review question. Uh, for, so for voluntary muscles, the motor neurons release what neurotransmitter to get the voluntary muscle to contract? And the answer is acetylcholine. Okay, but we're talking about uh, dopamine neurotransmitter. Well, so those neurons up in the brain that generate the um, the, the, the motor uh, signals, the neurons in the brain that generate the motor signals, uh, those use uh, dopamine as their neurotransmitter. Um, and there, there's kind of an interesting thing that relates to that. Um, some people, unfortunately, uh, get a disease um, called, um, called Parkinson's disease. And in Parkinson's disease, the parts of the brain that generate the motor signals um, start to decay. And so people with Parkinson's disease uh, start losing the ability to, to use their muscles. They start, they, they start losing the ability to use their uh, voluntary muscles uh, in any sort of coordinated way. Yeah, because those parts of the brain that generate the motor signals, those neurons are, are decaying. Now, for people who have Parkinson's disease, they are sometimes given drugs that boost the dopamine levels uh, in their brain. And even though these people are, are losing uh, neurons in their brain that, that generate the motor signals, uh, by boosting the um, amount of dopamine in the brain, that at least uh, partly compensates for the loss of those, um, uh, those neurons that generate, that, that generate um, uh, motor signals. And so at least in the early stages of the disease, these dopamine boost boosting drugs uh, help people who have uh, Parkinson's disease. Okay, so just to summarize the uh, parts of the brain that generate the motor nerve signals um, use the neurotransmitter dopamine. Uh, now, interestingly, there's a different part of the brain that also uses uh, dopamine as its neurotransmitter, and that's the part of the brain that are involved in what they call reward or pleasure feelings. If you do something that just physically makes you feel good, um, there's a part of the brain that generates those feelings of physically feeling good. And so that's sometimes called the reward or pleasure areas of the, of the brain. And so that's one of the reasons that, that uh, you know, taking certain kind of drugs like uh, cigarettes or alcohol or cocaine feels good because the uh, ingredients of those drugs, like the nicotine in the cigarette smoke, for example, uh, causes those uh, those reward and pleasure centers of the brain to, sec to secrete more dopamine. And it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, uh, these drugs actually cause boost not in just in dopamine, but some other neurotransmitters as well. So it's a bit complicated, but nevertheless, it is true that a lot of these drugs that make a person feel, uh, you know, pleasure um, um, are involved, uh, work by boosting the dopamine levels in the brain. All right, let's talk about uh, another one of these neurotransmitters, this one right here called, called serotonin. Um, serotonin is involved in, in regulating mood. Um, now, you know, I think all of us go through periods where we're feeling pretty good, you know, we're in a good mood, and other times we're feeling in kind of a bad mood, we might be sad or angry. But, you know, we have a, a general level of, of mood, and the serotonin is involved in the parts of the brain that tend to promote good moods. And so if, if, you're, if you're in a good mood, uh, you have um, um, 
adequate levels of, of serotonin uh, in your brain. Now, interestingly, serotonin, they've also found, reduces appetite a little bit. But here in this lecture, we're focusing on its, its, uh, its function of, of boosting our mood, keeping us in a good mood. Um, and some people suffer from uh, a disorder called clinical depression. And you know, I think we all get depressed sometimes by the various events in our lives. But people with clinical depression are stuck in that depressed state, and it gets so bad that they just can't function in normal life. They can't motivate themselves to go to work or get out of bed uh, or have meaningful relationships. That's clinical depression. And they treat people with clinical depression with drugs that boost the serotonin levels, right? Because serotonin is involved in, in, in boosting a person's mood. And so uh, just to give an example, there's a, a antidepressant drug called Zoloft that boosts the, dopa, the, uh, boosts the serotonin levels uh, in the brain. And I don't have a picture of it here, but there's another one called Prozac, and that also uh, boosts the, uh, the uh, serotonin levels in the brain as a way of, of treating the depression. All right, uh, so the next one uh, on our list of neurotransmitters is called uh, glutamic acid. And uh, so it it's functions in the, in the CNS. And if you look at the lecture handout, I described it as a general excitatory brain neuro neurotransmitter. So remember that oftentimes it's the case where one neuron um, is in, in a series, in, in a chain, so to speak, with another neuron. And when that first neuron has a uh, nerve signal, that neuron is trying to get the next neuron to also have a nerve signal. And remember, the way it works is um, that first neuron secretes neurotransmitters into the synapse. And the goal of that is to get the second neuron to have a nerve signal. Well, for most neurotransmitters, um, that's exactly what it is. The neurotransmitters are trying to get the next neuron to have a nerve signal. And we call those excitatory neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters that promote um, uh, the target cell of, of having its own nerve signal. And yeah, so most uh, neurotransmitters are excitatory neurotransmitters. And so what I'm saying in regard to glutamic acid is, um, here we go, glutamic acid is just sort of a general excitatory neurotransmitter. Uh, glutamic acid is used in many parts of the brain uh, for one interneuron uh, to um, try to excite, you know, try to have a nerve signal in another interneuron. All right, let's move on to uh, this one right here. Uh, so this um, neurotransmitter is, is called by an abbreviation uh, GABA. Uh, and there's a related neurotransmitter that I'm not showing here called glycine. Uh, so GABA and glycine uh, are used by neurons in the CNS and they are general inhibitory neurotransmitters inside the CNS. Um, so in some cases, the neurotransmitters that are secreted by one neuron, the goal of those neurotransmitters is to inhibit the next neuron from having a nerve signal. And so for those types of neurotransmitters, they are called inhibitory neurotransmitters. Um, and so remember that most neurotransmitters are excitatory, but there are a few of these inhibitory ones like GABA and glycine. Uh, and so I'm just saying that the, the GABA and glycine neurotransmitters um, are used um, in several parts of the brain as, as inhibitory neurotransmitters. Okay, well, the last neurotransmitter we're going to talk about is uh, this one here called endorphin. And if you look at the lecture handout, it describes, well, it says endorphins are, um, are used by neurons in the CNS. Um, that endorphins cause feelings of euphoria and pain reduction. And uh, so you're, you're, you, there are parts of your brain where the neurons secrete endorphin as their neurotransmitter, and those parts of the brain um, give you a feeling of euphoria and, and reduce physical pain. And uh, an example that's often cited um, of when a person's brain secretes these endorphins is something called runner's high. Uh, so some people run for miles and miles and miles, like marathon runners. I guess they run for 26 miles, right? And some of these people report getting something called runner's high. They, they'll say that, you know, I was running and I'd been running for hours and hours and you know, like 20 miles and I was feeling terrible. I had these 
pain in my feet and pain in my hips and sick to my stomach. It was awful. And then these people will say, all oh, out of nowhere, I got runner's high. And they'll say, you know, all of a sudden I felt like I was in this wonderful euphoric mood. I was just high and all my pain just vanished and I felt like I could run for the rest of eternity. Uh, so yeah, that's called runner's high. And not everybody gets that. I've, I've run a little bit throughout my life and I've never Fear, felt runners high. I've only felt runners low where, you know, my muscles are hurting as I'm running. But some people say they, they get this runners high. And what they think it is, they think it's endorphin release. They think that uh, the person's brains uh, that control these feelings of euphoria start secreting these endorphins. And so all of a sudden, all their pain vanishes and all of a sudden they just feel euphorically high and, and, and happy. That's that's a runner's high. And they think it comes from an endorphin release in the brain. Uh, now, um, there's a, a family of plants called opium plants and in the poppies of these plants like you see here the plant makes some chemicals that bind to the endorphin receptors and we, we, we call these chemicals opiates uh, and uh, you know people have extracted these opiates from the opium poppies and on the good side they use them for uh, legitimately used pain reducing medicines like morphine is a very strong uh, pain reducing medicine that's given to people in severe pain. But on the dark side, uh, the opiates can also be used to make uh, illegal and very addictive street drugs. For instance, heroin uh, is, is an opiate um, and it's extremely uh, addictive. And so what I'm saying is these, these opiate drugs, uh, when people put them into their bloodstream, either by injection or taking them as pills, um, these opiate drugs get inside the brain and they bind to the endorphin receptors, and so they trigger these feelings of euphoria and, and pain reduction. Um, oh yeah, so here's a, a quick review question. Um, so when we have a molecule that binds to a receptor, you know, like these opiate molecules bind to the endorphin receptors, and they activate that receptor, we say that the molecule is a what of the receptor? And the answer is agonist. Yeah, so these opiate molecules are agonists of the endorphin receptors. They bind to the endorphin receptor and they trigger it. Um, anyway, so these uh, these opiate molecules, like you find in heroin, heroin and other opiate drugs, um, get inside the brain and they bind to the endorphin receptors, and so they, they trigger uh, feelings of euphoria and pain reduction in the person. And unfortunately, that can be very, very addictive. Um, and it's not just uh, heroin. It's, that's not the only opiate. Um, you might have heard on the news that we're now having what they call the, the opioid crisis, where uh, patients who have been prescribed pain-reducing pills, opiate pills from their doctor, um, the patients get end up getting addicted to those uh, opioids. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of this part of the um, of the. Um, lecture on on uh, the nervous system but this was just the first part this was uh, part a part one and so now please uh, continue to part B of the uh, lecture on the nervous system